I'm Carolyn Giardino. Welcome to the Hollywood Reporter's Animation Shortcuts. I'm here today with Jill Colton, writer and director of Abominable. Uh, we have Dean Dubois, who's a writer, director, and executive producer of How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World. And we have Jinko Goto, who is the producer of Klaus. What character did you most identify with in your movies? Jill, would you like to start? Sure. Um... The main character in our film's name is Yi, and she's a 16-year-old kind of spirited Chinese girl that grows up in Shanghai. And when I got a chance to write this character, I was so excited because growing up um, in Ventura, which is kind of a seaside town, I was a surfer, tomboy, skateboarder. I love camping. I would just throw on clothes in the morning and not care what I look like. And um, I had grown up with a lot of princess movies, but I really couldn't relate to those. So I was very excited to tackle a character who was more of a tomboy, more free-spirited, more of the kind of girl that looks doesn't look before she leaves and sometimes gets into trouble. Kind of an artistic kid, too, and you can even see from the way she's dressed, she just throws on any clothes, and it's kind of her personality, and I love that. I love that there's a role model out there for girls like I was. A character that I most relate to would be Hiccup, just because he's a he's always been a bit of an outsider, and um, kind of puts a lot of focus, a lot of energy and effort into assimilating those. But he's a character who, who learns that those things he perceived as weaknesses are actually strengths. and and they can help define him. So as a kid who grew up loving comic books and avoiding sport, sports and kind of, you know, a little gay kid in a very conservative town, I, I knew that I had a lot to kind of bottle up and a lot, of, a lot to ultimately compensate for. Um, so I can relate to that character. And, and I think that uh, ultimately his journey is sort of a wish-fulfilling journey for a lot of oddballs. For me, it was Margu. She's a secondary character. She's a little Sammy girl that speaks not a word of um, English and shows up into Smearsburg and um, really, really connected with her because I, I was just like her when I came to this country, didn't speak a word of English. So when Sergio created this character, I said, I want more of her. She's <laughs> so magical. She's great. And so she's my favorite character. So let's talk a bit about the casting on some of your movies. You have a new villain. Grimmel, mm -hmm. who is voiced by F. Murray Abraham. Would you tell us about casting? Well, F. Murray Abraham is a force of nature. Uh, he is an actor's actor and, and just an amazing presence uh, to be in a room with. Uh, I learned so much from him personally because he's the most sort of passionate, dedicated artist. And um, at, at his age, I believe he was 76 when we were recording him, he would, uh, he would come in with just this impressive power. But he was actually cast in the movie as a result of our supervising animator for that character, Villain, doing some exploratory work. He found some voices that he liked uh, from actors that he admired on the internet, and, and he did this test, uh, which married so well with the character design, and he actually sort of brought to life this, this beautiful moment that had been borrowed from another television show, a little excerpt that, that Murray had starred in, and convinced all of us that he should be the voice and actually that test went a long way toward convincing Murray as well. Interesting. And Jingo, what was the trickiest character to cast in your movie? Jesper. In what way? So he's, he's the postman. Yes, he's the postman to... because I mean he's a he's an interesting character that has to really grow through this whole process and he has to be funny. He's a he's a bit cynical and and he's the protagonist and he's a complex character. So we needed someone that can bring his good and the bad and also keep humor into this so that it, he doesn't turn out to be a villain. So I think he was very difficult to cast, but we had a very short list and we're very, very fortunate to um, be able to cast um, Jason Swartman. And Jason was such a contributor to the whole process of build, uh, creating the character. And I think one of the biggest challenges for Sergio was that um, because you know we were in Madrid, all the recording sessions except for one session was um, with Jason happened remotely. But the two of them formed a really great, amazing relationship where they evolved the character over time. And Jill, for Yi, her age changed. She was, uh, she was a male at one point. Uh, how did you complete and then cast Chloe Bennett as your Yi? Well, the development process always goes through crazy changes. So yes, she was younger at one point, she was a boy at one point, but she ended up this wonderful, spirited 16-year-old girl. And Chloe brought such First of all, she has such a unique raspy voice for a female character. It was, I was really attracted to that 
coming from animation myself, I wanted to animate her. Just it was such, something so unique. Um, but the thing that I really appreciated about Chloe kind of evolved through the process of recording her. Um, I learned that, you know, she's, she's half Chinese and she grew up in Shanghai with her grandma, just like the character of Yi. I got to meet her grandma and her grandma is exactly like Nai Nai in our film, um, but more Chanel. <laughs> and uh, she and I really bonded over the fact that we grew up very similar, kind of rough and tumble, tomboys and she really could relate to this character. She grew up eating the same food that Yi eats, and she remembers sitting around a dinner table just like Yi does in the movie. And so throughout the process, Chloe really embodied her, and that was something really special that, um, you know, she didn't have to, she said she didn't have to act, but of course she did. Um, but it was easy for her because she really knew who this character was. She really lived that role. From casting to filmmakers, uh, are you seeing more diversity and inclusion in the animation world? Absolutely. I'm very proud to say that um, our crew has uh, almost equal parity in terms of gender. Right. Um, out of the 260 crew members, we represented 22 countries and 15 languages. So to me, that is as diverse as we have gotten with Beach Animation. So very, very proud of that. I've been seeing a lot of the incoming workforce, um, having talked to uh, students at different schools, the, the one I attended, Sheridan in Canada, but also NYU, and um, a few other spots where I can see that, that the, the balances have shifted, and we actually have more female students studying animation and right. of you know, varying uh, international backgrounds. They're entering the workforce, and they will soon you know, come in and start populating these studios, and we're going to see gender parity very soon, I think. Even within the films themselves, one thing that's really exciting for me is that DreamWorks partnered with Pearl Studio in Shanghai to do our film. And it's really the first um, big CG animated uh, film that takes place in China with the main cast that's all Chinese. And we were very diligent about casting all Chinese characters in the movie, including our loop group that's the background noise. and. When they came in, the loop group, um, I said, does anyone speak Mandarin? They all did. And I said, let's try the whole thing again in Mandarin. And, and you know, so even the background noise of street food being sold and people on bikes, it just gave the film an authenticity and a texture. And I'm really seeing how, um, as this film kind of rolls out into the world, and especially in China and also playing here for Chinese Americans, there's kids in the audience that are crying and it's because they finally see characters that are like themselves, you know, heroes that are like, look like them. And I, I'm, I'm so proud of being able to bring that. And I think that's just the beginning of, of these kind of movies going out to the world. John Favreau's The Lion King is photo real. Do you consider this an animated movie and why? You know, it's interesting because this is a touchy subject matter. There used to be films that were called you know, um, visual effects films that had visual effects in them, but the more and more all the characters are getting animated, then the lines get blurred between what's animation and what's um, considered kind of a visual effects film. But um, for me personally, I think for this group of people that grew up in traditional animation, it's, it's a hard, uh, it doesn't feel like animation. And part of that comes with the idea that uh, it's so photorealistic that the whole artistry of animation is to create worlds that don't exist, to be a combination of art and technology, and to create styles that um, these characters that are stylized can, can exist in and to make, uh, make the world believe they're real and they walk around and talk and breathe. And so when you compare it so much so to live action, it starts to feel to me like it falls into the visual effects category rather than animation. It's a topic that's getting a lot of debate. Dean, what do you think? Well, I think it's a really impressive exercise and, and you know, not to disparage John Favreau at all. I, I really liked what he did with Jungle Book as well. I think it's impressive to look at, um, but the power of animation for me has always been, you know, from day one of, of going to school for it, is, is the power of caricature, of taking emotion and expression and movement and caricaturing it in a way that feels um, somehow more potent than reality. Um, and by leaning on something that is so true you know, to realism, you actually find yourself restricted by the, the, the movements and the expressions that, that real life animals could make. 
Uh, so I think it takes, it actually takes a step down in terms of um, its potency and poignancy uh, as far as the characters being able to relay that story to the audience as they're, they're held back by their own restrictions of trying to pursue that, that kind of naturalism, that, that photorealism. I couldn't agree more with uh, what both uh, Jill and Dean are saying here because I think um, we've, we're crossing that line where technology is now capable of doing photorealism that it isn't really animation. These characters are more real, right? So why not just shoot them live, real? I mean, that would be my approach. I mean, I think it's great that we can push technology, but there's a purpose of animation, how technology works for animation. It's for us to be able to like create characters and worlds, like they both have been saying, that is magical, that we can't imagine the real world. So for me, pushing technology to where you're replicating reality, to me, is an animation. And we're going to have a fun closing question. What animated film most inspired you to get into the business? Well, there were two for me. Dumbo, it just really struck a chord. And I loved that drawings could kind of provoke that sort of an emotion. And similarly, um, the rescuers, the scene where Penny, the orphan, is sitting on her bed, dejected after um, some adoptive parents came in and picked the pretty girl instead. <laughs> and so she's <laughs> lamenting to her cat. Um, they, those are both moments that kind of transcended the illusion of life and went right to the heart. And it somehow it, it just intrigued me if I could apply my drawing ability mm -hmm. to tell stories that would actually move people um, and stay with people that, that seemed like a real ambition. Interesting. Jill, for me, I was really inspired by 101 Dalmatians. And it, it was a different kind of Disney film that's quiet it's not as chatty as some of the other movies and it's the, there's music involved in it right at the beginning it's kind of a gentle start and um, then it has that fantastic villain in it Cruella de Vil, which is one of my favorite villains of all time but the the, the movie itself had such um, beautiful drawings and beautiful backgrounds and it was kind of stylized and I just remember watching it kind of over and over again and being able to watch it over and over again because it's kind of gentle approach in storytelling and also I would say Sleeping Beauty was a big one for me because of the Ivan Earl backgrounds and the stylization of that movie it's stunningly gorgeous um, it had that kind of great mix and it was a strange mix a little bit back in the, the day for animation where they did a little bit of stats which is like the humans are a little more realistic but then they have animal counterparts that are fun mm -hmm. and funny and wonderful and horses that you know can emote mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but that beautiful combination of the stylized characters along with um, the Ivan Earl backgrounds just stuck with me and I realized, oh, wow, this is really art, you know. For me, it was Lady and Tramp. It was the first film I saw as a child, but when you look at the movie, there's a simplicity to the design, but these animals that talk and have personalities that have so much emotion, to me, it was like magical. It was so magical, and I remember seeing this and going, wow, this is what I want to do when I grow up. And at the time, my father had already immigrated to the U.S., so for me, it was also a depiction of what could America look like, so. Mm. What's funny about Lady and the Tramp is uh, when I started at Disney, mm -hmm. I, I was right next door to Joe Grant, uh -huh. who um, was a legendary story yes, artist yep. and designer. He told me that Walt Disney would come over to his house in La Crescenta on the weekends, and he had a little cocker spaniel named Lady, and they came up with this story of Lady and the Tramp right there. Isn't that amazing? Wow. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for watching.